So let's talk about English. It's spoken as a native language by over 350 million people worldwide, and as a second language by over a billion more. And pretty much all of you watching this video speak it pretty well too, right? So English must be pretty easy and simple and make sense, right? Mmm, wrong. English is super weird, and the reason why all comes back to its stormy history. I'm Moti Lieberman, and this is The Ling Space. Welcome to The Ling Space. So if you speak English, and especially if you learned it as a second language, you probably know that parts of it seem to make no sense. Like for verbs, you have I read, you read, she reads. And then it's back to read for the plural we, you, and they. So what's up with that S? Or just look at the richness of English spelling. Like thorough, or the fact that wind and fine don't rhyme even though they really look like they should. And then we have words like uncouth, where couth isn't even really a thing. So what's going on there? Well, it all comes down to the fact that Great Britain is a super hot island. Metaphorically. It's so hot, with all its natural resources and defensible shores, that over history, group after group of people have just wanted to go hang out there. And with each new wave of invasion came a new language, which influenced and mingled with whatever people were speaking before. So let's take a trip through time to try to pry apart all the influences that crafted that English language that we all know and maybe love today. The earliest inhabitants of England were mostly Celtic, like a lot of the societies in that area. Early on, though, in the first millennium CE, groups of people from the North Sea coast of mainland Europe migrated to Britain. Two of these groups were the Angles and the Saxons, and that's why the version of Germanic that came to be spoken in Britain is sometimes known as Anglo-Saxon. But more accurately, since there were a lot of other invaders too, let's just call it Old English. This is the language the famous epic Beowulf was written in, and if you could travel back in time a thousand years chronoguard style to the England of that day, you'd have a really hard time communicating. A lot of the vocabulary was different, even if we get bunches of words we still use today straight from Old English, like book, Thursday, daughter, stuff like that. But because this is a Germanic language, you get a big ol' set of grammar, with things like case on nouns to tell you what's the subject or object, or grammatical gender, which are things we still have in modern German. You end up with something that doesn't really sound like English at all. So, for example, a sentence like, the cruel man cut a page from the book, would have ended up something like this. Pretty different, right? Most of the grammar of Old English is withered away by now. But even so, if English were a house, Old English would be its foundations. We get a lot of the shape and structure of our modern language from its Germanic ancestor. That funky spelling full of useless letters? That's a holdover from the time when that GH in drought actually did something, and we pronounced it like drucht. Old English stuck around for centuries, evolving slowly like languages do. A bunch of Viking invasions in the 9th and 10th centuries sped that change up and gave us new sound clusters like the sk you get in skirt or script. Actually, skirt and shirt are just two versions of the same word, which originally meant some kind of tunicky thing. The Anglo-Saxon version with the sh ended up meaning the top part, while the Norse version that we got from the Vikings with the sk ended up meaning the bottom. And then, in the 12th century, something happened that would change everything. The Norman kings of France took over England. With them, they brought their culture and their government, and also words like fiction, special, parliament, and money. They brought their awesome French cooking, too, and that's why we have beef from the French boeuf, and pork from the French porc, and so on. If you look at English today, most of the words for meat come from French. But the original Anglo-Saxon terms live on in the animals themselves, so cow, swine, etc. But the Norman conquest changed a whole lot more than just vocabulary. English was renovated from top to bottom by the accelerated process of language change, and most of that Germanic syntax was just carted away. So let's say the Viking invasion supplied the English house with some new windows and a cool chimney. So then the French went in there and replaced the plumbing, and tore out the walls, and stuck another floor on there, and then painted the whole thing blue. The Germanic foundations still give English its overall shape, but there's a whole lot of French in there. Around the same time as the French were introducing beef in Parliament to the English language, 
And honestly, where would England be without beef in Parliament? Another language related to French was quickly becoming the must-know language of Europe. Theology, philosophy, medicine, science, those were all conducted mostly in Latin. So if you wanted in on all the cool discussions the scholarly types were having, that's what you needed. Because of this, and because Christianity sank itself into pretty much every part of medieval life, we got a whole lot of Latin into English, too. Latin gives us our isms and our ologies, our itises and oses. Put all this together, and by the end of the 12th century, English was so different from what it was 400 years before that it actually gets a new name, Middle English. This is the language of the poet Geoffrey Chaucer, and if you found yourself wandering into a book of Chaucer's verse, you might have a fighting chance at getting yourself understood. So if you hear the folk of Swindon sake in laulus chesa, you might get an idea that the people of Swindon are looking for some law-breaking cheese. The later Middle Ages and Renaissance is also when English started gaining some social prestige. For a long time, Latin and French were the languages of royalty and art, and politics and religion. But more and more, you started to see playwrights like Shakespeare and Marlowe writing their plays in English. And you even saw Bibles translated into English, and horror of horrors, higher education conducted in English. Maybe it was because more people across all classes of society were speaking English to each other. Or maybe it was because the Black Death in the 14th century caused huge migrations of people across England to try to get away from the disease. Or maybe it was for some as yet undiscovered reason. But somehow, during this time period, something fundamental changed in English that was just as big as the impact it got from French. Except this time, it wasn't due to an invasion for a change. The shift came from the inside out. Around the time of Shakespeare, the way people spoke was quickly changing. A word like team, which had been pronounced like team for hundreds of years, suddenly started sounding like time. Nam turned to name, hus turned to house, and stom to stone. The vowels of English started sliding around to make a whole new pattern in what's now known as the Great Vowel Shift. It's responsible for how English sounds today. And it accounts for most of the weird spelling things that weren't already explained by the loss of ch sounds and stuff like that from Old English. It also marks the beginning of what we call Modern English. Modern English has been changing constantly too. I mean, languages always do. Shakespeare is usually considered modern, and generally you can read him without a translation, unlike Beowulf or Chaucer. But that doesn't mean all the sounds and meanings of his time have stayed the same until today. Like when Hamlet said, I do not set my life for a pin's fee. However you look at it though, the changes since the 16th century have been a lot slower and less varied than what came before. One of the main reasons is probably that the printing press was introduced to England in 1476. Things got a lot more standardized once printed text was widespread. But there have been some important changes in the last few hundred years. For one thing, we stopped distinguishing between singular and plural U forms, like thou and ye. We rearranged the alphabet a bit too, so splitting up I and J, and V and U. We also scrapped symbols like thorn for th, and ash for at. And we stopped rolling our R's. Even today, the English language changes all the time, like from region to region, or through the long-distance communication magic that is the internet. English is a living language, and so it's going to keep growing and changing for as long as there's people to speak it. So we've reached the end of the link space for this week. If you followed the tide of historical change, you learned that Old English was brought to the shores of Great Britain by Germanic invaders, that English used to be far more Germanic before adapting to the French invasion, that going into modern English our vowels shifted all over our mouths, and that even if we're still within modern English, it doesn't mean that the language won't keep changing. The Link Space is produced by me, Moti Lieberman. It's directed by Adèle Louise Prévost, and it's written by both of us. Our production assistant is Georges Coulomb, our music and sound design is by Shane Turner, and our graphics team is Atelier Muse. We're down in the comments below, or you can bring the discussion back over to our website where we'll have some extra material on this topic. Check us out on Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you want to keep expanding your own personal link space, please subscribe. And we'll see you next Wednesday. See you in Yahal!